the next topic is uh, spinal cord some uh, details of the pathways passing through the spinal cord actually gray matter we have discussed earlier so white matter basically this time and we got a question on the white matter brown sequard syndrome what is the exception that is the question asking Understand that the brown sequard syndrome, which is a hemisection of the spinal cord and compromising the pathways, mostly ipsilateral problems are there. But there are some problems which are contralateral. So, which one is contralateral? It is choice number C. That is the answer. Why choice number C is the answer? Because it is contralateral loss of the crude touch. Why it is contralateral? Because it is carried by anterior spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract is a cross tract or it is running contralateral. That is the point here. So you are telling that the answer is choice number C. Yes, because most of the problems are ipsilateral but some are contralateral. This is anterior spinothalamic tract which is carrying crude touch so it is cross tract. If, uh, the crude touch is coming from left side, it is running on the right side of the spinal cord towards the brain. So, if the injury is on the right side of spinal cord, the problem will appear on the left side. That is the explanation. But we will see some diagrams also for that same. Keeping this answer, we will be now looking at the brown sequard syndrome patient. We got a patient. That patient had uh, right-sided brown sequard syndrome at the T10 spinal cord level. T10, right side, and hemisection of spinal cord. Now, if there is a hemisection of spinal cord at the T10 spinal cord, you will find that the most of the clinical features are coming on the same side, wherever the side is affected. And uh, they are uh, maybe the paralysis or maybe some sensory loss. But if you're talking about the loss of pain temperature and the crude sensation, they are contralateral. Why they are contralateral? Because they are carried by the spinothalamic tract. And spinothalamic tract is a cross tract and running contralateral. That's why the problems are contralateral. Now, once you say that pain temperature, crude sensations are contralateral, what is ipsilateral? See, this uh, problem, which is loss of pain temperature, is also one more specific feature. It is one or two segment below the level of lesion. If the lesion was at T10 spinal cord, the problem will come at uh, T11 or T12, one or two segment below the level of lesion. That also we need to explain why it happening that way. But see, there will be a flaccid paralysis, T10 muscles. The T10 muscles will have flaccid paralysis due to injury of lower motor neuron in the spinal cord. So lower motor neuron are injured in the spinal cord at the T10 level, there will be flaccid paralysis, but below the level of lesion, there is spastic paralysis. Why there is spastic paralysis below the level of lesion? Because uh, some pyramidal tract was injured and below the level of injury there will be UMN type of palsy, spastic paralysis. This ne you need to explain in some diagrams. But remember the clinical feature. And uh, this is one diagram which we are supposed to draw. Now when you are going to draw this diagram, understand the dorsal column running on dorsal side of spinal cord. Corticospinal tract is running laterally, spinothalamic tracts run anterolaterally, and this is lower motor neurons which are in the gray matter. This is where we are going to focus upon. See, dorsal column is damaged, so ipsilateral problems of sensations, and the spinothalamic tract injured, so contralateral problems of sensation. If corticospinal tract injured, ipsilateral spastic paralysis, and if lower motor neuron are injured, there will be flaccid paralysis at the same level. This is our discussion. So what you are supposed to do is take a transverse section of the spinal cord and uh, discuss the details. This diagram which we have taken from Harrison Medicine will tell you some briefing, then we can draw the diagram ourselves. Harrison Medicine, what is it telling? It is telling that this is the central canal of spinal cord which is filled with CSF and around that is some H-shaped gray matter. 
When you said is that shape gray matter, we already have discussed that earlier. There'll be some neuron bodies. We are not focusing upon that. What we are focusing is outside the periphery where you have some exons like these exons in the periphery. Now there are some exons in the periphery making the dorsal column because it is on the dorsal side of spinal cord it is called dorsal column having two fasciculi. Fasciculi means bundle of exons and there is a medial fasciculus which is gracilis and there is a lateral fasciculus which is skinnyatus. Now they are carrying some sensation. The dorsal column carries some sensation which will be actually five sensation we will be talking about but here just remember touch and pressure for the time being. So it is carrying touch and pressure, yes. Dorsal column carrying touch and pressure, yes. Okay. Then you are uh, Looking at the details of dorsal column, medial lemniscal system, before you proceed further with the previous section of the spinal cord. So you want to talk more about dorsal column. What is this medial lemniscus? That is the continuation. This is the first order neuron and that is the second order neuron. So there's a first order neuron, second order neuron. Yes, there's a third order also. But this is first and second order neuron. So let's do that. See, the dorsal column medial lemniscal system is uh, carrying some sensations. You will find there will be some receptors and the first order neuron is dorsal root ganglion running ipsilaterally and synapsing in some nuclei gracilis and cuneatus in the medulla. So are you talking about fasciculus cuneatus and uh, fasciculus gracilis synapsing in the nuclei in the medulla? Yes, and there the second order neuron will begin. As the second order neuron will begin, they will be running contralaterally the medial lemniscus to reach the third order neuron in the thalamus. And from the third order neuron in the thalamus, it will be passing through internal capsule to reach the postcentral gyrus, parietal sensory cortex, area number 1, 2, 3. This is our discussion. That is our discussion. So let's do that. See. When you're talking about dorsal column, medial lemniscal system, what is the receptor you're thinking about? They are the mesner carpuscle and the pacinian carpuscle. If you say they are the mesner and the pacinian carpuscle, then what is mesner carpuscle for? Do you remember we have discussed mesner carpuscle is for two-point discrimination, two-point discrimination and what is the Pacinian carpuscle for PP, pressure and not only pressure but also vibration. So receptor here are uh, Meissner for two-point discrimination and Pacinian carpuscle for pressure and vibration. Now they're carrying the information towards what? Towards the dorsal root ganglion and dorsal root ganglion is the first order neuron giving you fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis together called as dorsal column running ipsilaterally. So dorsal root ganglion is the first order neuron giving fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis and making the dorsal column running ipsilaterally. Yes, you can see that in the other diagram. Fasciculus cuneatus and gracilis. Now remember, if you say fasciculus gracilis, it is for the body below diaphragm. Body below diaphragm sensations, lower body sensations are carried by fasciculus gracilis, but body above the diaphragm. Upper body sensation will be carried by fasciculus cuneatus. So upper body sensation by fasciculus cuneatus, lower body by gracilis, but together they are making dorsal column and running on the same side, ipsilaterally. Now they are going to synapse in the nuclei, cuneatus and gracilis. These nuclei, cuneatus and gracilis are actually in the medial medulla. So they will not be affected in Wellenberg syndrome. Remember, dorsal column medial lemniscal system is not affected in Wellenberg syndrome because it is running near the midline. So you are telling that the synapse was in the nucleus gracilis cuneatus which is in the medial medulla, yes, which is not affected by Wellenberg syndrome, no. 
Okay. Now, what is this nuclei doing? They give the second order neuron which will cross the midline and start running as medial lemniscus. So, nuclei cuneatus gracilis will give you second order neuron which will cross the midline, start running as the medial lemniscus. What is a lemniscus? Bundle of axons. You're running near the midline, so medial. So, lemniscus is bundle of axon and it is called medial because running near the midline? Yes. Okay, then. The second order neuron running contralaterally, where is it going to synapse? In the third order neuron, thalamus. Now, if you say thalamus has a third order neuron, which nucleus? If you remember, we have discussed earlier VPL. What is VPL? Ventro posterior lateral nucleus of thalamus. Receiving sensation of the body, upper limb, lower limb, trunk region. So, third order neuron is in the thalamus, which is the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of thalamus. The third order neuron themselves, sent by thalamus, will be passing internal capsule before they reach the cerebral cortex. So, they are passing the internal capsule before they reach the cerebral cortex. Where they want to go to the cerebral cortex? You know that. Parietal sensory cortex, post-central gyrus, area number 1, 2, 3. So, area number 1, 2, 3 receiving general sensations like the pressure, vibration, tactile discrimination. Yes, that is the point. That is the point. Post-central gyrus. And uh, where is this uh, internal capsule fibers passing? You mean to say which part of internal capsule? Yes, anterior limb, posterior limb or the genu? Uh, dorsal column, I remember. Dorsal column carrying the touch sensation of the upper limb and lower limb was passing through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Now, if the posterior limb of internal capsule is compressed, is compromised, is having ischemia on the left side, if the posterior limb of the internal capsule having ischemia on the left side, where will be the loss of the pressure, vibration, tactile discrimination on the right side of the body. Contralateral problems. Patient number one. Patient number two, I have medial lemniscal injury in the brainstem. So, if you have medial lemniscal injury in the brainstem, again, the loss of uh, tactile discrimination or maybe pressure vibration will be on the contralateral side, on the right side. This is patient number two. And what if I have the third patient who has brown sequard syndrome on the right side? If you have a case of brown sequard syndrome on the right side, which is hemisection of the spinal cord on the right side, then of course, the loss of sensation will be on the same side, ipsilateral. So, first two patients, problems were contralateral. If the injury was in the internal capsule or in the brain stem, the problems are contralateral. But if the injury is in the spinal cord, brown sequard syndrome, it will be ipsilateral loss of sensations. This you have to remember. Now, as you are moving further, you will find that we are looking at this diagram again. Actually, the dorsal column and the fasciculus gracilis cuneatus, they were carrying pressure and vibration. Running ipsilaterally. What will happen when I have brown sequard syndrome? There will be loss of the pressure and vibration on the same side of the lesion. That was the point. Number two, there is this uh, dorsal and ventral spinal cerebellar tract, which is more important, the dorsal. Why dorsal is more important? Because there are more axons running dorsally. Do you remember what it was doing? It will carry the unconscious proprioception. Now, when you say it is carrying the unconscious proprioception, where from? The lower limb. What for? The coordination of the voluntary motor activity. So, as you're talking about the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, which is more important in ventral, it is carrying the unconscious proprioception towards the cerebellum and it is for the coordination of voluntary motor activity. What if it is lesion? If it is lesion, then there will be cerebellar ataxia. And when there is a cerebellar ataxia, what will happen? The heel shin test will become positive and patient cannot walk in a straight line. So, injury of this tract, patient cannot walk in a straight line? No, heel shin test is positive. We already have discussed these patients. 
Spinal cerebellar tract, you have discussed already that it is uh, dorsal spinal cerebellar tract which is running ipsilaterally, which is more important. And if it is damaged, then, uh, then there will be patient falling to the same side. Patient falling to the same side. Okay. What about the heel shin test? Yes, it will become positive on the same side. Patient cannot move the heel straight on the shin. And what is the other thing? Other thing is the patient is unable to walk in a straight line. There is a ataxic gait. This is what we have discussed. Do you remember? Okay, anyway, let us proceed further. And now we are talking about the anterior lateral spinothalamic tract. Now, when you say it is anterior lateral spinothalamic tract, they are running contralateral. If you are uh, damaging them, the problems will be appearing on the other side of the body. So, this lateral spinothalamic tract, yes. Or the corticospinal, this anterior or lateral spinothalamic tract, the information comes from the left side but cross in the spinal cord and run on the right side. So, if there is an injury on the right side, the problem will appear on the left side. That is the point here. Okay, if you are telling lateral spinothalamic tract was running contralateral, what is it doing? It carry the pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body. And uh, let us discuss the details now. So you want to discuss the details of lateral spinothalamic tract? Yes. Okay, let us do that. And as you are doing that, you will find this is the diagram. The spinal thalamic tract, spinal lemniscal system, spinal thalamic tract, spinal lemniscal system, actually spinal thalamic tract is the first order neuron and spinal lemniscal system is the second order neuron. Who is the receptor? Means uh, carrying pain temperature, yes. Pain temperature of the body, the receptor is free nerve ending. So free nerve ending are carrying pain and temperature where to? Actually, the first order neuron is again dorsal root ganglion. So, dorsal root ganglion is the first order neuron. Yes. Running uh, ipsilaterally? No, there is no ipsilateral thing here because immediately there is going to be a synapse in the posterior horn cell. So, immediately there is a synapse in the posterior horn cell now on the same side? Yes. Second order neuron? Yes. The posterior horn cell is the second order neuron and synapse on the same side immediately. It is the second order neuron which will send the fibers which will cross the midline of the body in the spinal cord and start running as the spinothalamic tract. So, spinothalamic tract is second order neuron? Yes. Crossing the midline where? Anterior white commissure. This crossing is in the anterior white commissure and then this is the second order neuron running as the lateral spinothalamic tract. When it is passing through the brain stem, there it is going to become spinal lemniscus. So lateral spinothalamic tract, when it is passing the brain stem, it is called as spinal lemniscus in the brain stem. So you are telling where is it synapsing? Third order neuron. Where is the third order neuron? Again in the thalamus, VPL nucleus. So this is the thalamic VPL nucleus, ventral posterior lateral nucleus, pain temperature of the body. Yes, pain temperature of the body. And uh, it will send the third order neuron. Thalamus will send a third order neuron passing internal capsule. After passing internal capsule, it will go to the cerebrum, area number 1, 2, 3, which is postcentral gyrus parietal sensory cortex receiving pain temperature of the body from the opposite side of the body. Can you tell me which part of the internal capsule it is using? The spinal thalamic tract, yes. Even the spinal thalamic tract is using the same part of the internal capsule because it is coming from the body sensations. Touch the upper limb, lower limb, the spinal thalamic tract carry the touch sensation. What, the lateral spinal thalamic tract? No, the other spinal thalamic tract, the ventral. But anyway, which part of the internal capsule? Actually, again, it was the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And what will happen if it is damaged, the posterior limb of internal capsule? If the posterior limb of internal capsule damaged, then obviously there will be loss of pain temperature, but on the, on the opposite side of the body. If the injury is on the right side, the loss of pain temperature will be on the left side of the body. Patient number one. 
And what about the patient number two? Patient number two, I have the right-sided Wallenberg syndrome, lateral medullary ischemia. If you say it is the right-sided Wallenberg syndrome and the lateral medullary ischemia injury of the spinal thalamic tract, again, the loss of pain temperature in the body will be on the contralateral side, on the left side. This is second patient having the Wallenberg syndrome on the right side, but the loss of pain temperature will be on the left side of the body. And what about the third patient who has brown sequard syndrome? Third patient who has brown sequard syndrome, hemisection of the spinal cord, and it is on the right side. Now, you again see the loss of pain temperature in the body is majorly on the left side. You mean to say all the three patients, maybe the injury was in the internal capsule or maybe in the brain stem, maybe in the spinal cord, all the three patients have contralateral loss of pain temperature in the body? Yes, that is what you have to remember. It's a crossed tract. In the antivital commissure, it has crossed already. Okay, fine. There is one more information. The information is in Harrison Medicine. It says, when the pain fibers come from the skin or the parts of the body wall, they ascend by one or two segments before they cross the midline. So fibers coming from the left side, they will ascend one or two segments before they synapse and cross the midline. What is the importance of knowing that? See, pain temperature fibers from here ascend one or two segments before they are synapsing and crossing the midline means if the injury was on the right side T10 spinal segment, where will be the loss of the pain and temperature? One or two segment below the level of lesion T12 and below the level of T12. Though the injury is T10 but the sensory loss will be at one or two segments below the level of lesion. This is important to know. So with that information, we can proceed further. We are uh, going to look at this diagram again. We were telling that this is the lateral spinal thalamic tract and which is coming from the left side and running on the right side and going upside up to the brain. If you damage it on the right side, the problems will come on the left side and one or two segments below the level of lesion. What is the anterior spinal thalamic tract carrying? Anterior spinal thalamic tract is also running contralateral and it is carrying the crude sensations. Like what? Like uh, touch and pressure. But touch and pressure is already carried by dorsal column. Yeah, it is, but uh, it has a minor role. What do you mean by minor role? What is this minor role? Because touch and pressure is already carried by dorsal column. Actually, you have to understand that uh, if you are talking about the crude touch or the light touch, if you are talking about crude touch or the light touch, then it is carried by anterior spinal thalamic tract. But for the dorsal column, you have DDD. What is this dorsal column DDD? Actually, dorsal column D is carrying the deep touch and the discriminative touch. So when you say it is uh, DDD for the dorsal column, the first D is for the dorsal column, the other D is deep touch, yeah, deep touch, and then discriminative touch, yes. Discriminative touch requires fine touch. It requires fine touch. There is a fine touch and there is a crude touch. So what is the difference between fine touch and crude touch? Difference between fine touch and crude touch is that crude touch is carried by anterior spinal thalamic tract. Yeah, that is understood, but what is the difference between crude touch and fine touch? That's what fine touch is carried by the dorsal column. Understood, but what is the difference between fine touch and crude touch? See, take a pencil, the tip of pencil is fine touch. You're touching one point. And what if you touch with the rubber, then you are touching a wide area, it is crude touch. So touching one point is fine touch and touching a wide area is crude touch. So we will carry the crude touch. That is carried by anterior spinal thalamic tract and who is carrying the fine touch. That is important for two point discrimination carried by dorsal column. Let me show you some diagram also. See, take a cotton and touch the skin, wide area, so it is crude touch and it is also light touch, light touch, light touch and crude touch is carried by anterior spinal thalamic tract. But if you are looking at the other one, 
which is uh, deep touch, which require fine touch, like two point discrimination. You are touching two points, so this is carried by dorsal column. Dorsal column. This is the difference. So touching two point, two point discrimination that is requiring fine touch, and that is carried by the dorsal column. That is the difference. Okay, fine. Now we want to look at the motor tract also, which is a part of the pyramidal system, and it is corticospinal tract. We will show the corticospinal tract on the same side of the lesion. We had a case of right-sided brown sequard syndrome, so we want to talk about that only. So they are showing it on the left side, the pyramidal tract, but we'll carry it to the right side. You mean to say you're going to draw the diagram now? Yes. Okay. What will happen if the pyramidal tract injured on the right side? Wherever it is injured, there will be spastic paralysis because it is human fibers coming from cerebrum. So these are some human fiber coming from cerebrum. Yes. Can we discuss about this tract then? Yes, let's do that. Actually, it is important for fine and skilled voluntary motor activity like uh, putting a thread into needle done by pyramidal system. So fine and skilled voluntary motor activity, putting a thread into needle is done by pyramidal system. Who was planning and programming? Planning programming is uh, basal ganglia. And who is coordinating? Coordination is cerebellum. So cerebellum is coordination. And uh, who is doing the actual job? Actually, it is done by pyramidal system. Fine and skilled voluntary motor activity. Okay. So we want to talk more about the pyramidal tract now. As you do that, understand there is upper motor neuron which is in the cerebrum and uh, it is, can also be in the brainstem. Though mostly they are in the cerebrum, brainstem is mostly having lower motor neuron. So where is lower motor neuron? Lower motor neuron are in the brainstem and the spinal cord. Brainstem will give you cranial nerves and control skeletal muscles. Spinal cord will give you spinal nerve and control the skeletal muscles. So you are telling that there is some upper motor neuron in the cerebrum which is controlling the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord and brainstem, yes. And which themselves are controlling skeletal muscles, maybe the cranial nerve or spinal nerve, yes. And if you let free the lower motor neuron, let us say lower motor neurons are free to fire frequently, what will happen? Let us say the lower motor neurons are free to fire frequently, but if they are free to fire frequently, the muscle will go into spasm, spastic paralysis, spastic paralysis. So they must be inhibited. And that inhibition is done by upper motor neurons. Though it is not strictly inhibitory, upper motor neurons are going to inhibit the lower motor neurons so that they don't keep firing frequently and keeping the muscle into spasm. They must be inhibited. But remember, when you say upper motor neurons are inhibitory to low motor neuron, it is not exactly the same. They are actually excitatory also. In fact, they are modulatory. When you say upper motor neurons are modulatory on the lower motor neuron, it means they can excite, they can inhibit. But generally speaking, if you let the lower motor neuron just work like that, it is not good. So upper motor neuron would prefer inhibiting them. But they cannot be totally inhibited. So some excitement also required for activity. So they are modulatory. And what if I damage the upper motor neuron? If you damage upper motor neuron, then it is human palsy. And when there is human palsy, what will happen? The lower motor neuron is free to fire frequently. So the muscle will go into spastic paralysis. So whenever there is human palsy, the inhibition is compromised. And the lower motor neuron is free to fire frequently, the muscle going to span, spastic paralysis. And what if it is poliovirus lesion? Means the lower motor neuron injury. Yes, poliovirus. If you say poliovirus lesion, lower motor neuron injury, then we have seen if the nerve is not there, the muscle is not there. Means flaccid paralysis. See, poliovirus will damage the lower motor neuron and the muscle will not work. Skeletal muscle will not work. There will be flaccid paralysis. So, human lesions present with spastic Spastic paralysis because element became free to fire frequently. But if you damage the low motor neuron itself, then there will be 
flaccid paralysis. This is the basics. Now let us go to the detail. Also remember, this is the homunculus. What homunculus? You remember face is more lateral, then upper is the arm and lower limb is on the medial side of cerebrum, that motor homunculus. If you want to control the fingers, then you have to use what is called corticospinal tract. And if you want to move your eyeballs then it is corticonuclear tract so this is going to be corticonuclear tract yes and that is going to be the corticospinal tract yes together they are called as pyramidal system if you want to move your fingers then use the corticospinal tract and if you want to move your eyes to put the thread into needle you know pyramidal system move the eyes that is corticonuclear tract and to their pyramidal system. Remember, corticonuclear tract is crossing at the level of uh, synapse with the lower motor neuron, but the corticospinal tract has already crossed at the lower medulla and then synapse in the spinal cord later down there. So, this is some basics. Now, all the details. As we are telling, upper motor neurons are usually in the cerebral cortex and they are supposed to be modulatory on the lower motor neurons. And where are the lower motor neurons? Lower motor neurons are either in the brain stem or in the spinal cord. And what are they supposed to do? Lower motor neurons are uh, going to control the muscles like there is a brain stem giving cranial nerve to control the skeletal muscle. This is the spinal cord giving spinal nerve to control the skeletal muscle. So, what will happen if I let them free to fire frequently? If you let the lower motor neuron free to fire frequently, then they will take the muscle to spasm. There will be spastic paralysis. They must be inhibited. They must be modulated by, by the upper motor neuron. So, upper motor neurons are inhibitory to lower motor neuron. Not necessarily. They can be excitatory also. They are actually modulatory, but they are definitely inhibitory because if they don't inhibit, then the lower motor neurons can be giving problems. Okay, so you are telling that if the upper motor neuron fibers are compromised, the inhibition is compromised? Yes, human lesion, that inhibition is gone. And in that case, the lower motor neurons become free to fire frequently. That is why there is a spastic paralysis on the other hand. If you have something like poliovirus lesion, like in the spinal cord, there's a poliovirus lesion, what will happen? The lower motor neuron is gone, the nerve is gone, and when the nerve is gone, the muscle cannot work. Muscle is flaccid, there will be flaccid paralysis. Remember, injury to lower motor neuron, the nerve is gone, and if the nerves are not working, muscles are not working, they're going to flaccid paralysis. So, LMN injury, flaccid paralysis. Understand? UMN injuries will present with spastic paralysis and the LMN injuries will present with the flaccid paralysis. Okay, now we are telling that I want to control my eyeball muscles because I want to look at the eye of the needle because that is where I have to put the thread, you know. So you will use corticonuclear tract which will be crossing at the level of the synapse only. Corticonuclear tract is also called corticobulbar tract and understand that the brain of the left side control the muscles on the right side. Mostly it will happen like that but not necessarily. Can you tell me one thing? The corticonuclear tract which you are talking about is passing through the internal capsule. Which part of the internal capsule the corticonuclear tract is passing? Corticonuclear tract, you remember? Yes, the genu. And what will happen if I have injury to the genu of the internal capsule on the left side? If you have injury to the genu of the internal capsule on the left side, then there will be <coughs> paralysis on the right side of the body. Injury to the genu on the left side of the internal capsule brain, the Paralysis will be on the right side of the body and lower face is involved. Why lower face is involved? Why not the upper face? Only orbicularis oris is involved, dribbling of saliva. But there is no paralysis of orbicularis ocula. You don't need to pad the eyeball. Why? Why not? See, this is human facial palsy. So, human facial palsy will spare the upper face. Only lower face is involved. Why? Because only 
lower face is having contralateral innervation. So orbicularis oris is having contralateral innervation. Only supply from the opposite brain. What about the upper face like orbicularis oculi? Not only controlled by the left side, but it is also controlled by right side. It is bilateral innervation. Maybe your patient is having a problem of the left genu, but the right is still working. You mean to say this will be still working and orbicularis oculi is still working? Yes, but since the orbicularis oris has only contralateral supply, if you damage it here, then it is gone there. Okay, can you see that? Show that in some diagram? Yeah, let us see. My point is, my point is that uh, if I am talking about a lesion in the genu of the internal capsule on the left side, there will be only lower face involved on the right side. Only lower face involved on the right side. Why only lower face? Why not the upper face? Because the thing is, the lower face is getting the contralateral supply only. You mean to say for the lower face there is only contralateral supply? Yes. So once there is a lesion in the genu, once there is a lesion in the genu, then of course the lower face will be compromised on the other side of the face. But understand when you are talking on the upper face, upper face is uh, having the supply not only from contralateral side, but also from the ipsilateral side. So you are telling that for upper face, there is a supply from the left side as well as right side. Yes, that is why. If there was a lesion on the left genu, maybe one set of fiber is gone, but the other set of fiber is still working. So, so it will be still working. You see, this system is still working. From which side? From the right side. So, orbicularis or is still, orbicularis oculi is still working? Yes. No need to pad the eyeball here because it is human type of facial palsy. See, maybe the left sided fibers have been compromised to the upper face, but uh, the right sided fibers are still working. So, orbicularis oculi is still working. No need to pad the eyeball. There is only a problem which is dribbling of saliva because lower face muscles have only contralateral innervation. They do not have ipsilateral innervation. Right brain do not supply the right lower face. And what if it is Bell's palsy, which is LMN injury? If you say it is uh, Bell's palsy and LMN injury, if it is Bell's palsy, if it is LMN, then both the muscles are gone. Maybe it is orbicularis oculi or maybe it is orbicularis oris. You have to pat the eyeball and you have to tell the patient, put finger in the mouth and uh, take the food out because there is, uh, you know, accumulation of food here. So you are telling the Bell's palsy is element type of palsy. Yes. And both the fibers may be right sided brain or left sided brain. All the fibers have been compromised. Yes. So ipsilateral facial palsy. Yes, ipsilateral facial palsy and both the upper face, lower face involved in Bell's palsy. But in human facial palsy, the upper face is spared because upper face has double innervation. The right tract is still working. This is the point. Okay, anyway, what about the finger? If I want to put a thread into the needle, corticospinal tract. And if you say corticospinal tract, then can you tell me one thing? Corticospinal tract is passing through which part of internal capsule? Uh, which part of internal capsule? Yes. I think corticospinal tract for the finger movement is passing the posterior limb. Yeah, correct. And what will happen if there is injury to posterior limb of internal capsule on the left brain? If you have injury to the posterior limb of the Internal capsule on the left side, then there will be spastic paralysis on the right side of the body. Spastic paralysis on the right side of the body. Why spastic paralysis? Because you are removing the inhibition and the lower motor neuron will be becoming free to fire frequently. That's why spastic. But why on the left side? Because it is the right, why on the right side? The spastic paralysis is on the right side. Why? Because left brain control the right side of the body. That's why. If lesion is on the 
left side of the brain, the spastic paralysis will be on the right side of the body. Okay, fine. It is on the left side because of the fact that there is a crossing here. Where? Where is the crossing? Where is the pyramidal decussation? Here, it is actually in the lower medulla. So there was some crossing of fiber. How many fibers cross? 80 to 90 percent fibers cross. So 80 to 90 percent fibers will cross in the lower medulla and innervate the opposite side muscles in the body. Yes, pyramidal decussation, lower medulla. Now, after decussation, if there is an injury to the pyramidal tract, then where will be the spastic paralysis? If there is injury to the pyramidal tract after decussation in the spinal cord, there is injury. Where will be the spastic paralysis? It will be on the same side. This time it is ipsilateral. So this time it will be ipsilateral spastic paralysis. Yes, understand. Injury in the brain, there will be contralateral spastic paralysis. And injury in the spinal cord, there will be ipsilateral spastic paralysis. Why spastic in both the cases? Because you are damaging the upper motor neuron. Maybe in the brain or maybe in the spinal cord. So you mean to say when I damage the upper motor neuron fiber, wherever it will be spastic paralysis? Yes. What is the boundary line between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron then? Tell the synapse. Tell the synapse. So before the synapse, if you damage, maybe in the spinal cord or maybe in the brain, there will be spastic paralysis. And what if it is beyond that? What if it is after the synapse? After the synapse, there will be difference. See, this diagram will tell you that if the injury was on, see, if the injury was on the right-sided internal capsule, this is actually left-sided. Let us assume this is left side because we are discussing left side. So let us assume if injury was on the left sided internal capsule, the problem will come on the right side of the body. That is the point here. An internal capsule is upper motor neuron fiber, so there will be spastic paralysis, especially in the body, upper limb and lower limb. So injury of the internal capsule on the left side, there will be contralateral spastic paralysis in the body. On the right side, there will be there will be flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb. So upper limb will go into flexion deformity and lower limb goes into extension deformity. Where is the lesion? Lesion is on the left side. That is what happens. Let me show you the diagram. See, there will be lower face weakness if genu is involved and there will be flexion deformity for upper limb and extension deformity for lower limb. There will be a circumduction gate also. Where is the injury? Injury was in the genu of the left side. So genu of the left side, lower face involved? Yes. And upper limb goes into flexion deformity? Yes. And lower limb goes into extension deformity? Yes. Circumduction gate. So this is what you have to understand. Anyhow, what will happen if the injury is after the synapse, means lower motor neuron involved? If it is after the synapse, lower motor involved, then this would be poliovirus lesion. And when there's a poliovirus lesion, the nerve is not working. If the nerve is not working, the muscle is not working, there'll be flaccid paralysis. There'll be flaccid paralysis. So beyond the synapse, if there is an injury, then it is element type of injury, there'll be flaccid paralysis. Now, this is flaccid paralysis, some polio-like patient. You are feeling the tone. The tone is also not there. That is the point. So, flashy paralysis, there will be no tone to the muscle. That is the point. Lower motor neurons are not working. Poliovirus lesion. If you remember, we have discussed this earlier as well. Now, we are looking at brown sequard syndrome on the right side T10 spinal cord. If you say brown sequard syndrome on the right side T10 spinal segment, then I'll tell you. It will be actually upper motor neuron plus lower motor neuron injury, but lower motor neurons will be damaged only at the T10 spinal cord. So very few lower motor neurons involved. Only T10 muscle will be in flaccid paralysis. Only T10 muscle will be in flaccid paralysis, but a huge number of exons have been compromised, which were coming from the cerebrum. So you mean to say when there's a brown sequard syndrome, it is human plus LMN injury? Yes, but LMN injury is very limited. It is limited only to the T10 spinal cord and only T10 muscles will be in flaccid paralysis. 
Otherwise, there's a huge bundle of exon which have been compromised. What bundle of exon? The entire bundle of exon which was supposed to synapse at the T10 spinal cord 11 or 12 or whatever below that, you know, all of that has been compromised. What is the, what is the point here? Point is, when there is human plus element injury, brown sequard syndrome, you will see there is a flaccid paralysis at the same level of the injury, T10 muscles are flaccid due to, because LMNAs are not there, so muscles are not working, but below that level, see, only T10 muscle will be flaccid, below that level you will find that there will be lower motor neurons becoming, lower motor neurons becoming free to fire frequently. And as they are free to fire frequently, below the level of lesion, they will cause spastic paralysis below the level of lesion. But why did they become free to fire frequently? See, because the upper motor neuron fibers, a big bundle of fiber was damaged. The fibers which are supposed to synapse, not only at the T10, 11, 12, 11, 2, 3, 4, S1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, all the bundle of exon damage. So, so when all that bundle of exon damage, inhibition gone. So, so lower motor neuron become free to fire frequently. In brown sequard syndrome, all the upper motor neuron fibers were damaged, which were supposed to control low motor neuron. Now they cannot inhibit, so low motor neuron are free to fire frequently. That's why spastic paralysis. But why not at the level of the injury? Why there is no spastic paralysis? How can there be spastic paralysis? Who brings the spastic paralysis? The low motor neuron. Is the no low motor neuron working there? No. So at the level, flaccid. But below the level, spastic. At the level, there is flaccid, but below the level, there is spastic paralysis. Now, we are going to draw a diagram with all these details. And, and that is what we will be doing now. But as we are talking about this tract, all the tracts, the brown sequard syndrome, you have to understand that uh, whatever fibers are Passing in half of the spinal cord, most of the problems are ipsilateral. There are some problems which will be coming contralateral. We are making this diagram now. In our diagram will show dorsal column and also the spinal cerebellar tract and also the spinal thalamic tract and then also corticospinal tract. Now, on the same side of the spinal cord, this is the transverse section of the spinal cord and showing central canal filled with the CSF and around that is some gray matter which we are not concerned with. There will be some lower motor neuron here. Then we are actually concerned with white matter at a large scale. So you are telling that this is transverse section of spinal cord showing the central canal filled with CSF and around that is some H-shaped gray matter. Yeah, H-shaped gray matter. And there you will have some lower motor neuron. Yes, lower motor neurons. But we are not much bothered about their gray matter. We are more concerned about the white matter this time. So what is about the white matter? It is at the periphery. And what is it doing at the periphery, the white matter? Actually, there are two bundle of exons. What is this two bundle of exon collection of exons doing? They are making the dorsal column. If they are making the dorsal column, so what is this dorsal column supposed to do? Carry information towards the cerebrum, the conscious level. Which part of the cerebrum? That is area number one, two, three. So you are telling that there is a dorsal column of spinal cord having some collection of exon carrying the sensation towards the cerebrum area number one, two, three, conscious level. Yeah, conscious level. So what sensations are conscious then? Let us see. But first you tell that we have got a fasciculus cuneatus and we have got a fasciculus gracilis. Now when you say there's a fasciculus cuneatus, it is uh, carrying the information from the upper body and if you say fasciculus gracilis, it is from the lower body and the demarcation point is the diaphragm. So you have to understand that the body 
above the diaphragm is the upper body and that uh, information is carried by fasciculus cuneatus which is more lateral more lateral so more laterally present is the fasciculus cuneatus carrying information of the upper body above diaphragm but body below diaphragm which is the lower body sensation will be carried by fasciculus gracilis which is near the midline so near the midline you have got the fasciculus gracilis carrying information from the lower body i got a question for you i'm asking which of the two will carry urinary bladder pressure sensation? Urinary bladder pressure sensation is carried by which of the two? And your answer is body below diaphragm, fasciculus gracilis. Since the urinary bladder pressure sensation is body below diaphragm, will be carried by the fasciculus gracilis. Now remember, dorsal column is carrying five sensations. We want to discuss one of the five sensations carried by the dorsal column. And... You already told one, it was pressure. Now, if you say pressure, you know, pressure is carried by Pacinian carpuscle, and Pacinian carpuscle also carry vibration here. So, you are telling that there is some Pacinian carpuscle carrying pressure vibration along the dorsal column? Yes. What is Meisner's carrying? Meisner's, yes. Tactile discrimination, two point discrimination. So, Meisner's carpuscle was carrying. See, when you are talking about the Pacinian carpuscle, it was carrying pressure, PP, and it is also carrying the vibration. But uh, mesial carpuscle is carrying tactile discrimination, which is two-point discrimination, which is actually the fine touch also there, carried by the dorsal column, by mesial carpuscle. And if you remember, both of them are rapidly adapting receptor. Pacinian carpuscle and mesial carpuscle both are rapidly adapting receptors. Now, what else the dorsal column is carrying to the cerebrum? It is also carrying stereonosis. And what is stereonosis? Stereonosis is... You have to tell the patient, close your eyes and feel and identify the object. So feel and identify object. What object? Maybe a coin. You gave a coin to the patient. That is stereonosis. So stereonosis is carried by dorsal column. Yes. And how do you check that? Ask the patient to close his eyes and give him some object like coin and tell him, feel the coin, identify the coin. So feel and identify coin without looking at the coin? Yes, a stereonosis is carried by dorsal column. What else it is carrying? It is also carrying what is called as conscious proprioception. Conscious proprioception. I know proprioception. Proprioception is position sense. But why are you telling it is conscious? Because it is reaching conscious level, the cerebrum. Area number 1, 2, 3, carried by dorsal column. So dorsal column also carry few fibers for position sense, proprioception. And that is conscious proprioception because dorsal column carry all these sensation to the cerebrum. You remember? Since dorsal column is carrying all that information towards the cerebrum, the conscious level, this is conscious proprioception. But remember, conscious proprioception is very few fibers. Mostly the proprioception is unconscious. And who is carrying that? Unconscious proprioception. If you remember, we have discussed earlier, there is a dorsal and ventral. So this is dorsal and ventral. Spinocerebellar tract, yes. And in the dorsal ventral spinocerebellar tract, which is more important, dorsal. It has more number of axons, so dorsal spinocerebellar tract is more important. What is it carrying? It is carrying the unconscious proprioception. So, as you remember, we have discussed earlier that... Uh, there is a dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tract and it is carrying unconscious proprioception. Why would you say unconscious? Because it is stopping at the level of cerebellum. Do not reach the level of cerebrum. Cerebrum is conscious level. Okay, so unconscious proprioception mostly carried by dorsal spinocerebellar tract for what purpose? What was the purpose? Purpose you remember? The purpose was to coordinate the voluntary motor activity. And what if it is damaged? If it is damaged, there will be cerebellar ataxia. And what will happen if there is a cerebellar ataxia? There will be in coordination. Patient cannot walk in a straight line. That is what will happen. 
So telling that when there's injury to dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, the unconscious proprioception has been compromised and the cerebellar ataxia leading to the patient having incoordination. Yes, they keep falling to the same side of lesion. Heel, <coughs> heel shin test will become positive to the same side of lesion. Okay, fine. Okay. What about the spinal thalamic tract? As you're talking about spinal thalamic tract, it is running in two bundles, but it is running ipsi or contra, contralateral. When you say it is running contralateral collection of axons, the information coming from one side of the body run on the other side of the spinal cord. So they are cross track, they are running contralateral. Now when you are telling spinal thalamic tract is running contralateral, information came from this side of the body and running on the other side of the spinal cord, fine. Name, name or uh, there is this lateral, cortic, lateral spinal thalamic tract and there is anterior spinal thalamic tract. And what is the lateral spinal thalamic tract doing? The lateral spinal thalamic tract is carrying pain and temperature from the same side of the body. Now if you say lateral, spinal thalamic tract is carrying pain temperature from the same side of the body. What is the anterior spinal thalamic tract doing? Anterior spinal thalamic tract is carrying touch and pressure. But if it is carrying touch and pressure, touch and pressure is already carried by dorsal column. What is it doing? Minor role, minor role, minor role. So you're talking about the spinal thalamic tract here? Yes. And there is a contralateral running spinal thalamic tract, which is the lateral corticospinal tract, lateral spinal thalamic tract, which is carrying pain temperature of the body. Yes. And then there's anterior spinal thalamic tract, which is carrying touch and pressure, which is already carried by dorsal column, but it is having some minor role. What is this minor role? Actually, you are talking about crude sensation and light sensation. Crude touch, light touch, like take cotton and touch, that is light touch sensation, crude touch sensation, carried by anterior spinal thalamic tract. Otherwise, otherwise, there's a DDD. What is DDD? That dorsal column carry deeper sensation and the discriminative sensation. That was the DDD. So you are telling that there is a DDD means dorsal column carry deeper sensation, discriminative sensation, which is you already have told that there is a requirement of the fine touch and fine touch two point discrimination is done by dorsal column there. Now we have to talk about one motor column also and as you see the motor column is here. What is this? This is the pyramidal tract now. As you are talking about the pyramidal tract you will see it is UMN fiber coming from cerebrum of the opposite side. So this is the pyramidal tract, the corticospinal tract now. Yes and it came from the opposite side of the body. See corticospinal tract would have started on the left brain and crossing in the medulla come to the right side of spinal cord. And if you are telling that this is pyramidal tract or corticospinal tract and upper motor neuron fibers coming from the cerebrum, what will happen if I injure it? If you injure it, then there will be human type of palsy. What is that? Spastic paralysis. Now, if you say there will be spastic paralysis, it will be hypertonia and there will be hyperreflexia also. Understand, when there is injury to the pyramidal tract, it is a tract which came from opposite sided cerebrum and it was carrying some upper motor neuron fibers. If you damage upper motor neuron fibers now, there will be spastic paralysis but below the level of lesion. There will be hypertonia, hyperreflexia, human type of features but below the level of lesion. Why not at the level of lesion? Because at the level of lesion there is flaccid paralysis. Why there is flaccid paralysis at the level of lesion? Because lower motor neurons are compromised at the level of lesion leading to flaccid paralysis. So since very few but lower motor neurons were damaged at the level of lesion. So flaccid paralysis at the level of lesion. But below the level of lesion, spastic paralysis. This is what we wanted to know. And we already have found the information. So, stenosis, I told you, is, uh, you know, give a 
pen to the patient or a coin to the patient and ask him to close his eyes and feel the pen or coin identify that by feeling that is cyanosis carried by dorsal column to the conscious level cerebrum dorsal column is involved now I will be looking at this patient which we have seen right sided brown sequard syndrome if you say it is the right sided brown sequard syndrome you have drawn the diagram already. Describe your patient. As I'm describing my patient, there will be fascicular sclerosis and gracilis damage on the right side. So if it is damage on the right side, then what will the problem? Problem will be on the right side, there will be loss of five sensation. What are the five sensation lost when the dorsal column is damaged? Pressure and vibration and tactile discrimination and cyanosis and conscious proprioception on the same side. If the fascicular sclerosis gas is damaged on the right side, the right side only will have loss of five sensation, pressure, vibration, tactile discrimination, cyanosis, conscious proprioception, loss same side. And what about the Dorsal spinocerebellar tract damage. If the dorsal spinocerebellar tract is damaged, then there will be ipsilateral ataxia. Patient key falling to same side. Heel chin test positive on the same side. Cerebellar ataxia in coordination. Patient cannot walk in a straight line. Okay, fine. What about the corticospinal tract? If corticospinal tract is damaged on the right side, then the right sided spastic paralysis below the level of lesion why the spastic paralysis is below the level of lesion because at the level of lesion there is some flaccid palsy so at the below the level of lesion there will be spastic paralysis but at the level of lesion there are some low motor neuron damage and because low motor neuron damage at the level of lesion there will be flaccid paralysis t10 muscles will have flaccid paralysis but t11 12 11 2s 1 2 spastic only t10 is flaccid so you mean to say there is flaccid paralysis on the same side at the affected myotome yes affected myotome only Below that will be spastic paralysis. And what about the spinal thalamic tract? If the spinal thalamic tract is damaged, wherever it is damaged, maybe if it is damaged on the right side, then there will be loss of pain temperature on the left side of the body, contralateral. So that problem will be contralateral. So telling contralateral means whatever problems were there, they are almost all ipsilateral except the loss of pain temperature on the other side of the body. Yes. Because spinothalamic tract is a cross tract. See, spastic paralysis is below the level of lesion because of UMN palsy. The parabellal tract, a big bundle of exon parabellal tract was damaged. So lower muscles become free to fire frequently and then they are spastic. But if you see at the level of lesion, the low motor neurons were not working. No spasticity can be there. So flaccid paralysis at the level of lesion. And uh, what are the five sensation lost on the same side? That is the pressure, touch, vibration, stenosis, conscious proprioception on the same side. And what is on the opposite side? That is loss of pain temperature and crude sensation because it is anterior spinothalamic tract and lateral spinothalamic tract and that also one or two segment below the level of lesion. Why one or two segment below the level of lesion? Because we have learnt the fibers which come from the left side, they first ascend one or two segments before they are crossing the midline. So if T10 spinal cord is damaged, the sensory loss pain temperature will be one or two segments below the level of lesion. T12 downward, one or two segments below the level of lesion.